How's everyone doing? My name's Mike, and my counterpart, JC. Here we go. Here we go. Um, this is an extreme honor for us to be moderating the largest thing in the world. So, the hell for me is we're going to bring everybody up on stage. All right. Without further ado, here we have the thing cast for you here. Keith David, Todd Lakes, Ricky Thompson, Keith David, Well, the guy pulled out a 45 on this watch. <laughs> <laughs> but 
have been a terrible as that to get his hands off me. <laughs> So they have never seen a black person in person before. So they said to TK, can you walk the bear? They said, can you walk like they do on TV? And TK said, no man, I'm from Beverly Hills. No, no, he said that the only black person that he knew, I'm not bullshitting, was George Jefferson. So I said, Columbia, and there was a border uh, station between the two, about halfway between. Um, everybody from Stewart, where uh, where all the liquor is government controlled in Canada and very expensive, would just walk or drive over to Hyder and buy all that liquor and go to drink there. And there were seven bars in Hyder, Alaska that had a population of about 15 people. <laughs> and they all worked in the bars. And the big one was the Hyder Inn, where, where they had a tree that was half the length of this room, which had been cut down, split down the middle, turned over, and the, the cut part was polished. That was the bar. It was huge. You remember that? And then when you went to Hyder, you had to stop at the bar, you had to go into the bar and get Hyderites. You, you guys right. Now they all got Hyderites. Hyderites. Let's so, get so, 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 so they all got Hyderites at the same time. You did, right? Yeah, no, you did. But, I, but everybody else, um, that's what you did. But uh, you talk about, because I got Hyderized later, because oh, I came up a little later. Yeah, like, when you got Hyderized, they would give you this uh, liquor called Everclear, which is like, you know what I mean? 191. So they, 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 they stand in front of you and say, "Get a juice, please." You, you're about to be hydrized. You have to drink it all in one gulp. If you spill mm -hmm. any, you've got to buy everybody in the bar. And you can't drink. smell it. You can't That's spill it. nothing. So if you Kurt, can't throw up. Man. So Kurt thought that I couldn't drink. So he got me this, the Everclear, and everything. you're Jewish. We always think we can't So I, I took this thing and I took it down. So I looked at me and I. See, I can drink, man. <laughs> I can do anything you can do. It was unbelievable. It was burned your throat. And you take the glass. You take the glass. You turn it upside down on the bar, right. and, the, and the bartender would swirl it around, lift it up, hit it with a match, and would go. Boom. Yeah. If you really mess your throat up. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I got I got a high to rise. And when I took my high to rise shot, I was the last one because I, I said it's a setup. <laughs> so when I took my, my high rise, it would just burn my throat and I immediately start sounding like Red Fox, like, uh, look at your son. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> it was burning. But I, I gotta tell you, man, what I remember uh, about going to the hotel the first night we got up there was a lot of people had a lot of teeth missing. <laughs> and there was this young kid. I swear, he was, must have been about 22 years old, but he looked 60. Because <laughs> all they was doing up there was drinking and working in the coal mine, but they're probably some of the most funniest people that I've ever met. But it was, it was, it was amazing. Canada is, is, is just an experience for me. Canada, last is experience. But, you know, it was kind of cold. And, you know, I got, I got a love, oh, oh Canada. <laughs> So getting to when you guys were actually shooting the film, you know, it's an all-male ensemble cast, and as things started to digress, the paranormal, or paranoia started to kick into gear. Talk about how you guys filmed that. Was there actually a little bit of hatred between you guys with spending so much time together? How, how did that play out? Well, we rehearsed this movie, which was very unusual. We had uh, two, two weeks of rehearsal, and. Uh, John had never done it before, and when we finished, he said he would never do it again. <laughs> because, because the actors, you know, we came in and, and we started really talking about who these guys were and how they interacted with each other. Keith and I figured this thing out, which wasn't in the script originally. We were the two big men, and we decided 
we really, because he was a little skinny guy then. Um, and and uh, we decided that we, we just hated each other, um, you know, and, and, and we had a lot of stuff that we, right. that was in the script, and then we shot it all in, in, uh, uh, in California on stage in Universal, and then we shut down for like three months while they went out and waited for the snow to fall and for the snowpack to build up in, 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 in uh, British Columbia. And during that time, they made a rough assemblage of all the stuff we'd shot. We'd shot probably 80%, 85% uh, of the movie at that point. And John sits down and he looks at the rough assemblage, including all these really tense scenes between the guys inside, because we were all trapped. That's what the story was about, is we couldn't get out. And he, he looked at this and he said, this is a boring movie about a bunch of guys standing around inside talking. And so, <laughs> so he rewrote a third of the movie and reshot it up in, uh, uh, up in Canada. And a, a bunch of the stuff that we did that we really loved, because it was so yeah. intense and needy, got moved outside and it all, it, it, it changed. It wasn't, because all of a sudden we could go outside and live. And originally the movie was, if we went outside, we died. So he, he did it cleverly because he meant, he turned that, that windstorm where they go out to, the, to, to uh, find Brimley and all that, and, and he gets lost on the line, and they get locked, and McCready gets locked out and all that. But that was where they inserted the part of that, if you go out now, you're gonna die, right? But, but earlier when, you know, uh, I'm not, uh, I know I'm human, you know, we're all standing around, I said, we're dead, what are you doing out here? Well, I remember when we were shooting the movie, as the movie started progressing, um, we really were kind of like, wouldn't trust who could, we always would ask the question, could he be the thing, is he the thing? We knew what could happen in the script, but we, we were really preparing as if, listen, I, 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 don't, I don't know, I think, I think you are, I think you are, no, maybe him, no. But I can actually tell you that when we were shooting that movie on Universal Live, that it was, it was when they would shut the lights down and we go to lunch, it was really scary in there. Yeah. I mean, it was not like, oh, we're going to do this movie. We were really kind of like, it was kind of spooky in there. Well, I have, a, I think, an interesting story about me and Clinton, David Clinton and I, we had a scene <laughs> where we were um, talking together and we had about a page, half a page of dialogue. And we rehearsed the scene and John Carpenter goes, uh, listen, you guys, I gotta cut that. I can't use it in the movie. And I know I had a lot of text, so I was very upset. And David, you know, being a sympathetic actor, we both went around the corner and we're like, that's so <laughs> so important. And David's like, yeah, man, how can he do that to us? That's, that's just, what a fucking asshole. You know, <laughs> I forgot that I was mic'd. He <laughs> <laughs> was a hard ass on the movie. He comes around the corner and he goes, hey guys, I just heard every word you said. <laughs> and mostly it was me. I was so mortified, like the blood <laughs> drained from my face. And I remember David said to me, well, after a few hours, I'm like, well, what am I gonna do? I've already, I mean, it's not like I can say, I didn't do it. <laughs> and David gave me a line that I've never forgotten. He said, there's always gotta be a little mutiny on every set. <laughs> and that stuck with me the rest of my life. And there does, in a way, it's healthy. And that was, but I wrote him a note later and I apologized and I think he, I hope he forgave me. <laughs> well, you know, he came off the Warriors and shit. So he came in there like a gangster. <laughs> we all do these all trying to figure our characters out, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, the characters that you see, um, they were written, but we, they, we added certain things to build our character, because I remember when I was uh, bringing dolls, I was like, man, the dude has to wear a headband, you know, so wore the headband, and then I was like, man, look, it's boring up here, and I'm coming on some roller skates. Yeah. Because roller skates was, was happening back then. And I really knew how to skate, so you know, there was this one scene where I had to, you know, flip off the radio. I remember that move. It was, I remember that move, it was a cold ass move. Remember that move? <laughs> That move was like, hey, it's in the kitchen, whoop, 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 step it on, whoop, whoop, hit, bump, cut, refrigerator, turn around, take it on the radio towel back up on the camera. That was the whole move. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, talking about something that TK mentioned earlier, you know, wondering who might be the thing. 
guys ever speculate whenever you guys were shooting the movie? If you were the thing, if you would know. If you know you were being simulated, would you know? <laughs> Everybody else talked about it until I went to sleep. We wasted a lot of time talking about it. <laughs> See, we all read the script, so it was, it was, there was a spoiler for us. We knew, we knew who was in it. And, uh, no, I, I don't mean as far as character. I mean, if you were there, I'd tell you and, what the, and the thing took a hold of you, would you know it? Well, actually, that was the... That was, that was a big question on the set. Behind, behind we, don't, your we don't be standing around saying, if you're the thing, do you know you're the thing? Or if you've been absorbed, do you, did you guys see the movie? <laughs> the, the thing kills the thing that it duplicates. <laughs> they was getting too, <laughs> they was getting too deep. I was like, I know I'm not the thing, and I'm whooping everybody's ass who is the thing. I know I'm the thing. I thought it was Paul because I was like, anybody that smoke weed like that is a monster. would sit there and, 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 and one day he just went, oh, and, 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 and we went, what? And he said, you guys all think this movie's so bad. You, you haven't figured out yet this ain't about us. It's about the rubber guy. It's not about us. And that's right. Wilfred Brimley, now, there's, in my acting career, there's two actors that, one, I really didn't particularly care for, because his ass was red now. <laughs> under the table, and that was Kenneth McMillan in Runaway Trump. He's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but I always thought that Wilfred Brimley had a little redneck in him, but it was a cool redneck because he really wouldn't open up. He was friendly, but he wouldn't open up. Yeah. Uh, just uh, leave him alone. We're just going to be. <laughs> See, we're going to rehearse the scene. And just stare at you. <laughs> and there was a scene, I think I could have seen with him when I went into the shack or something. I don't, I, it was a while back. But the guy was just sitting there and I said, This guy is really that guy, whoever cast him. And then from then on, I was just seeing the house. I said, That's Wilbur Brimley. And he's a great actor. God bless his soul. And he's a good dude. <laughs> <laughs> so on the money themes associated, Keith, I gotta ask, nobody's talking about who people actually believe in this kind of stuff. I've heard you in interviews. Do you actually worry that some of these horror fans actually believe in this shit? I'm sure some of you do. <laughs> and you know who you are. Yes. <laughs> Such avid fans and bugs. They will ask you. You know, in that scene, after the head went this way, what were you thinking about when you said it? And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> it was 30 years ago. I don't know. <laughs> specific question, uh, more of a general one. You know, there's many themes associated with this film. Paranoia, hopelessness, isolation, you know, we're in the top three. What do you guys believe is the one that sticks out the most? I, I, this isn't exactly responsive to that, but I just, when, when the original novella was written, Who Goes There, was, was really at the very first uh, blooming of uh, communist paranoia in this country. Um, the McCarthy era was really, really intense. And the, what he wrote about was the enemy within, the enemy who couldn't understand, couldn't know who the enemy was, that the enemy could be anyone. And it was out to kill you and out to take you over. That was the original novella. Then they made the first film, 
And, and by then, it was a little later, and they made a, a more general film where they took that element completely out of it. Because may, I don't know whether it was philosophical or what, but they made it not about the enemy within, but they made it this external thing who was coming down to get you. And in a way, maybe that was more Korean War oriented, because there was really an external thing that, that, that the US perceived itself as it was like, which was you know international communism in Korea. That, but then by the time we made this movie in the 80s, um, everybody who grew up with a, um, um, who, in our core audience for this film, who, who, they, they weren't alive when, when, when the, the novella was written. They weren't alive in the period when this kind of paranoia existed. So it, it wasn't, it, it had lost that, that uh, uh, I don't know how to put it, but it had lost that, that uh, edge. Because when the, if you go back and you read the, the original novella, it's just all about this terror of, it, it's, there's very little happens in terms of you know, destructive stuff and all. It's just this terror of not knowing where Suspicious. Yeah, where the enemy is. Yeah. And, and, but but, but uh, by the time this came along, it, it became externalized in this, in this combination of the two, where it was internal, but also would become external. I don't know why I'm battling about this, but for me, that was the most you interesting thing. Get it off the chest. <laughs> <laughs> Shot us in '80 and '81, and then when the AIDS crisis was just beginning to really right. well, boom, that was the So for me, you know, it was in 1937 when the original novella was written. We were finding out what Stalin was doing by '51. McCarthy was pushing his trials. When we got to '81, the AIDS crisis was breaking out in this country. So there's always been, it seems to me, coincidentally, some kind of virus that's infecting us that everybody's afraid of and they get scared of each other and they're looking to see how they're going to survive and I thought that this touched on that. And then they were at scary. Well, well when, 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 I, when I, speaking of the, the old script, uh, then you know, I read the old book and then read the, the new script and what got me excited about this movie is that I had a habit of always thumbing through my scripts right by now when am I going to get it? Like, when I get something comfort, I say, oh, brother, the first one to go, right? <laughs> so when I looked at this, the theme script, I was kind of, oh, no. Oh, he's still in the movie, but oh, Charles, he's still in the movie? Oh, the brothers is past, got double halftime. Oh, what? <laughs> Shit, the brothers is never here. Because I would go down in history as the first black man, me and Keith, to be in a horror film without them killing us while the open credits are rolling. Truman Foster that, I was like, look, uh, when, I, when, I, when they asked me, they said, oh yeah, man, I had to be with John Carpenter Universal. And, you know, it was coming off this film, and I'm sitting in there with the detective. He said, yeah, it's a horror film called Thing. I said, man, I don't even know why I'm sitting up in this meeting. You know you guys are going to kill the brother. <laughs> they just smile and stuff, you know. And I guess, you know, uh, a lot of people have been asking me the question for 30 years. What happened to you in the Thing? Well, I'm going to let you in on what happened. Okay. Now, from what I hear, they said that the movie was going a little bit over budget, they ran out of money, and they wasn't going to do a big death scene with me. So they told me to walk down that the bottom where the thing comes out the ground and goes toward Kurt, and walk down there and act like you hear something, and then just walk in the room. So I walked in the room. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to YouTube this, and I'm going to do the continuation when I come out the room into the snow and say, what happened? Where did everybody go? <laughs> <laughs> you know, to give you the, I guess, the real picture of it, you have these actors from New York, and we were, you know, much younger then, and trying to make our way, and trying to make a name for ourselves, and and we're in this room, and John really was not into filmmaking in that sense. Right? He was a filmmaker that made movies, but he really wasn't that. He would tell you himself, you know, acting is your thing. You know, I film it. 
And uh, after a while, at least I know, I kind of drove him crazy because I kept saying, well, why am I doing this? And why am I doing that? And he's like, well, do you have to have a motivation for everything? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, well, I'm an actor. That's what I have to know why I'm doing it. And after a while, you know, he really got it. He got <laughs> sick of it. And, uh, you know, one time we were talking and he said, what are you guys talking about? Your motivation? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, I'll tell you what your motivation is. Your paycheck. Now leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that was interesting that came out of it, despite all of the, you know, because for him it was very difficult. But think of something you're not used to doing and then make yourself do it for two weeks. And he's listening to us and he put up with us and he was very patient, you know. But one day I came in and I said, listen, I want to change the character's name from Simmons to Windows. And <laughs> I put these glasses on, but anyway, okay, Windows, yeah, I like that. And then everybody started calling me Windows, so something really good. Oh, and you up. asked us to, you said, can you all please call me Windows? <laughs> <laughs> dark stage, on a sad stage, just a table and all of us, can you all please call me Windows? No. He puts on these glasses and we're going, whatever. Well, okay. you know, uh, you know, we, we all, you know, it was amazing now that I look back at this film, and I've probably, you know, seen this film plenty of times, more than I've ever experienced it today in the past, but and when I look at it is that each actor that was in this movie, man. I gotta tell you, um, tremendous. Um, and everyone had their own personality. It was just like, no one was like the other person. So God bless Charlie Callahan, uh, who, man, I love him too. Man. Was, Charlie was like, man, Charlie was like a quarterback, man. He was like Ben Roethlisberger, man. He, into his head, fell off. <laughs> and I remember that I remember that day when when they brought the amputee and they used the real amputees. Uh, I seen a dude. I'm not gonna talk about it. But I seen a dude come up to me, high five me with nubs. You two brothers, hey man, you know we're gonna be working together. So what the hell is you, man? I'm gonna put my hand in the dude's head. Now this poor man was in, he was in makeup for like four hours because they had to make they had to make him look like Dice Hart, so they put this Dick Dice Hart mask on him and then then they had to make his his arms, which were you know, which he had lost up to here, look like they were bloody stumps and he had all these all, all these tubes running through them and so they could fire the blood out there and everything. And and we're all walking around. I don't know, I, this is how I remember. We're all walking around going, this is horrible. <laughs> this is hard. And then also we find out the guy lost his arms in an industrial accident, which was essentially exactly like what he was going to be doing. And we're all, so, so I, I, I think a few of us at various points went over to him and went, hey, how's it going, man? How is, is this, how is this for you? Is this okay? And he was going, this is great. This is so great. I can't wait. This is so, I hope I do it well. You know, he was so sweet. I, ju I just arrived in Hollywood, and uh, when I saw this guy, he looked exactly like Dice Hart. Oh, yeah. And I, well, they, they, they made him up, and I walked in on the, on the scene and saw the guy. I thought it was Dice Hart at first, and then I realized it wasn't, but it looked like, and when he did the, the, the stunt, and he, his arms stayed in the body, and he pulled him up, the blood went squirting out, and I saw this guy, it was an exact double dice art. I thought, they can get anything they want out here. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I thought they wouldn't even need acting. You just find somebody exactly what you want. It was my first experience with uh, just how deep Hollywood's hands go into the world. And when we did that scene, when we did that scene, one thing I like about John Carpenter is like, I, I watch how people die in movies and stuff. Charlton Heston was the best. When he get killed, he just grabs shit. Just <laughs> for five minutes. In. <laughs> you know how to get about that? But what John Carpenter would do is like, when somebody would get it, like the dude, when Dice Hart went in the chest and the arms, we thought he'd say cut, 
But that blood kept going and kept going. And he said, what are your arms? What are your arms? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, enough. He's with him. And when he got, and I was telling him today at the tank, I said, remember that scene when you got burnt up? Remember? <laughs> and they had this, this dummy that looked like him, <laughs> like this. <laughs> and they had these wires, but you couldn't see them. But when the guy got on fire, we were like, okay, that's a wrap. John said, keep the camera rolling and move those legs. <laughs> <laughs> so I love John Carpenter. True realism, man. Directed, man. Realism, man. I have to ask, though, I mean, as far as you guys are talking about the special effects, what about the makeup? I mean, just sitting in that chair, doing the makeup, being in a studio, Damn hot, it's like what, 100 degrees outside in LA? You go back and it's like 30 degrees cooled off so they can make it look like it's Antarctica. What was that process like, just sitting in the chair going from hot to cold, putting the hours for the makeup on? Where's our I don't believe most of us had to do it. No, Not most of us. us. No, it was so, to the end. Uh, you know, it, 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 was, uh, it was a little easier than that for some of us because before. Before we started work on the film, they just did life masks of us. And then uh, when we had to do the, the uh, transformations, we got to go home. And then they did, they did the transformations after, after the... Is this going to spoil it for anybody? Who has to see the movie? All right. <laughs> but, so, so it was... So we did really spend a lot of time. No, actually, not no, all of us. Yeah, no, I right. think actually, uh, uh, very, very few, almost all of the, the well, all the transformations, because there's no CGI <coughs> in this movie. It's all rubber and. and, 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 and <laughs> Rob Bodine, shout out to him. No one, no one will ever do that again because no one will ever have to do that again. <coughs> Uh, but, but no one will ever do that again. And uh, I just want to mention one other thing since we're talking about the scene where it dies, Dr. Charlie died. Um, so David asked me to tell this story. So we're, we're standing in there and we're shooting, we're shooting the sequence, the follow-up, where the head comes off. Now obviously, while we're in there, the head's not coming off. Charlie's there on the table and he needed his head. Um, so, so we're, but we're playing, you know, we're, it's all the reactions of us you know, looking at this and looking at that, one thing and another. And then, the best line in the movie, David. <laughs> uh, Palmer, I think, is the first one to see the head yeah. Yeah. Walking, yeah. Out, walking out of the room. And then sometime between the first version of the script and the shooting script that we used up, oh, when, when, when did we shoot that? That was down in, in uh, Universal City. Um, uh, that line turned up saying the script the you know everybody out in, in the audience is watching this tour de force uh, transformation is probably pretty scared and, and thinking oh, how did they do that and somebody on screen says what a lot of people are thinking <laughs> and so uh, that that line turned up after after our rehearsal, right? Period, hey, right? It came and, up in rehearsal. And and so John did a did a camera set up and a camera block to shoot that part of the scene where Palmer notices going, and then um, Windows turns around, and then. Uh, Kurt turns around. And she after, all these reactions. After Palmer says, you got to be fucking kidding. <laughs> and John got the shot right. with his, with the setup. With the storyboard that John created before him. Right, that he had designed. And he said, next. Yeah, we're moving out of here. Cut, next. And I set up, or, or, or we're through. And I thought, that's, that's fine. We're ready, ready to move on. But Richard Masser approached with John, I believe, yes. or, or uh, went, went up to him or 
had a with tremendous high tension. With a tremendous high yeah. I said, and he you, have, you didn't shoot. Time. You didn't shoot Clemens saying the line. He said, No, no, I'm going to be over here. I said, Oh no, you can't leave here and not shoot Clemens saying the line. He said, No, look. Yeah, and he shows me on the storyboard. I said, I don't give a flying fuck about the story. <laughs> <laughs> not. I said, We're here. Shoot him. He goes, Oh, all right. And he does. And so, of course, it's the best. Moment in the entire movie <laughs> is this man's face looking at that moment. Got to be now, you can't imagine this movie without that moment. So, yes, John, great with keep the blood going, but not always great with where the laughs are because he, he was completely willing to sacrifice that to his vision. And that's the other thing that I think was interesting for John and made him a better director, because I think this is the best thing John's ever done, far and away. And, and I think what made him a better director on this film that was that he was constantly being challenged and pushed by all of us, but also by, I, I, by Kurt also. I mean, yeah. Kurt who had done a lot of stuff, and he, his direction changed as a result of this movie. He became much more open to more interesting possibilities. Things weren't as cleanly delineated. They became blurry. Uh, when I went to audition for this film, I had gone to USC for undergraduate school. So I, I came in and met John. I didn't know him at USC. But I said, oh, I hear you went to USC. He said, yeah, I got it. I said, did you direct any theater? Because a lot of the cast were theater actors. Richard went to Yale, and so did David, and Pete, and Tommy went to Juilliard. I went to Yale. So, I'm great at the LA Actors Theater. Hey, and Donald Moffat was the guy there. And he was at the Royal Academy. So a lot of us were theater actors, and we were used to rehearsing, as we said. I, so I said to John, oh, you were at SC. Did you ever direct any theater? And he went, no. And I said, well, how the fuck are you supposed to direct me? <laughs> <laughs> and Dayton Foster, the, the producer, looked at me like, <laughs> I just lost the job. And John, there was a moment, and then he smiled at me, and he hired me. I think he hired me because I said that to him. He was married to Adrienne Barbeau. He knew all of it. <laughs> In any case, a lot of what we rehearsed in the two weeks that we did rehearse did suddenly, as Richard said, show up on the screen in the relationships between the actors and the different responses to what was going on there. And it's true, I think this was John's best movie. And it was a movie that was in progress as we were making it. The cinematography, we were developing, they were, Dean and John and Rob were developing ways cinematically to capture what they had in mind. And John kept working on the script. And things just were in flux through the whole thing. In it. And it turned out that once it was trusted that this was going to turn out the way it did. And John said to me, when he saw the head work on screen, he said he knew the movie was going to work. When he saw that head walk away from Ch Charlie, when it popped out, because it was all happening in front of him, Rob designed that, John went, oh my god, this is going to work. This is really going to work. And I really do think, as a, you know, as a, an honor to John and, and the whole creative team, it was his, at, to that point, and still, to my mind, it was his best one. I think, I think it is best thing, John. I think we started gelling as, as, as a group, as a group, was a scene where, where uh, they were taking people's blood, and we were in that room. And we had nothing to do, we were in that room for a while. Because so I was just, dead by then. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> But, where they started jelly. Yeah. <laughs> well, peanut butter and jelly was the peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter and jelly. It was peanut butter and jelly. But um, I got to tell you, getting prepared for this movie was like, we worked our bus off, man. You know, I, I was like, man, do I really want to stay as an actor, man? Because this stuff is hard. You know, I remember one night we were up and uh, doing a night shoot, and it must have got about, what, 40 below, 30 below, 30 or 40 below? I'm going, like, I'm going like, damn, 
you get lost out here. Don't nobody give a damn. You be a popsicle. It was just like, yo, it was, it was crazy. But um, I got to tell you, that was funny for me. And Eddie Murphy always tells me, he says, man, that, that scene where you guys are tied up in a chair. <laughs> you know, when whoever edited that scene, man, I was laughing because they cut my finger, right? And I couldn't even say nothing. They just, you know, they thought it was me, and then all of a sudden, cut, and now I'm a, with a gun on somebody, you know. <laughs> so, hey, I love that thing. I appreciate y'all being thing fans, and we know that, you know, we now know that we, we did this not for us, but we did it for generations and generations to come. And we did it. It wasn't, there was nothing slasher about this movie at all. It was a science fiction movie. 
again, I'm always amazed that we get invited to these things because we're not a horror movie in the strictest sense of the word. We're a science fiction movie with a monster in the middle of it, you know. But but uh, uh, but but I don't I don't think I, I, what, the story I was told at the time Dave, was was that was that we uh, that that this was purely about if you remember they were shooting cat people the same time we were shooting it universally. Yeah, they had those 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 lions and tigers by my dressing room. <laughs> And, 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 you know, it was this costume. Kinski, who was the hottest in the way, the hottest woman in the world at that moment. And everybody thought, you know, that, that was, the, they was expected that to be their giant film. Well, of course, nobody ever saw that movie again. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, and, and I don't know that it flopped so much as it never found an audience because they never really, Released it. Also, they it. released it. Uh, E.T. opened the week before we opened. And E.T. <laughs> should <laughs> yeah, <we> just got <laughs> washed over the world, I think. Mean. <laughs> and then the week after we opened, Poltergeist opened, which was like a, a you know a scary movie, and we got lost in the middle because they did not. Well, that's well, the other so reason I should have held off. If they if they cared about trying to make it work, they never would have released a science fiction movie at that moment in time. Well, I, one thing, I, I, knew, I knew that the movie, listen, you know, whether it was hit or not, I just, I just knew based off of what I saw and based off the work that was in, whether it was hit or not, I was like, man, this is a great movie, right? But I knew for a fact that this movie, I did, I knew that it was going to grow on people, because, you know, it's like fine wine. You understand what I'm saying? The more it ages, it gets better and better and better. And each time you look at the thing, you find something. That's why they did that other movie, the thing with the prequel, whatever it is. Oh, yeah. yeah, the prequel. But I knew when they started coming out with games and my little residual checks started looking like, oh, they're ripping us off? What the heck? We got a game and shit? Oh, yeah. oh, you in the game. I said, uh oh, I got another check coming and the check <laughs> Back. <coughs> Rob Motin had told a story one time about um, when Morris was on the table and there was a accident with a fireball and wasn't sure if any of you guys were in that room when that ignited fire. No, you know what, I think that happened in the, in the, when they were shooting the, the effects the stuff. Effects. I don't think that happened when yeah, they were shooting the live stuff. What the bottom line with the with with with, with those effects, uh, we did learn how to shoot the the uh, flamethrowers in the beginning, but then they came. You know, Mike. They 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 they, 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 hey, you, you get this for free, so sit down. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll get this guy. We'll have a drink. Four black guys that I follow. They were doing it. No, but. We were shooting the movie, and then somebody said, "Yeah, you're gonna have to you have to walk, run down this hallway, and you're gonna actually have to throw these dynamite sticks in these rooms." And I said, "Oh, no problem. I gotta do that." But then I saw these things look like cannons that were pointing out on each room, and they were timed, and I had to, to have the precise timing of throwing them in that room with that fire coming out. And I swear, I could feel the heat. If I'd have been two or three seconds late, barbecue. Well, one more. One final comment. What will barbecue like you? Two minutes left. One more question over here. One final comment from a fan. I just want to say first and foremost, thank you guys for being together. This is the first time ever since the production of John Carpenter's The Thing. As many people from the cast have been here together. Thank you. So, uh, we're going to thank you guys again for taking the time out to do the panel. We really appreciate it. One more time, thank you.